Thank you, Walter. <laughs> Uh, I have to thank Walter for one of his, his typically very generous introductions. And, I, you know, it's funny because lately Walter and the Humanity Center have asked us to sort of submit a few word, a few sentences that Walter can read as an introduction. And I always try to make it very, very simple. And, and Walter, of course, gives us very generous uh, introduction. And I think next time I may try a different strategy and, 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 and just... Um, grossly exaggerate things, and maybe, maybe <laughs> and, and see if Walter can top it. Um, so. But it, I, I do want to thank Walter, not just for the generous introduction, but for the support that he's given me here at the university over the years. It is hard to believe that I've been here for um, 13 years. And I want to thank the Humanities Center, because as Walter pointed out, the paper that I'm presenting today uh, is a paper that grew out of a grant that I received as part of the Gender and Sexuality Faculty Fellowship Competition. Uh, and for faculty in the room who do not know about the Faculty Fellowship Competitions, that, that, that is something that you ought to pay attention to because they have been great sources of support uh, each year for people working on a particular theme. And this year's coming theme is... Borders and Intersections. Borders and Intersections, which is a very interesting theme um, and one that one can approach from a variety of different angles. Uh, and as a result of that support, I produce a paper. I'm not going to read the paper today, but if any of you want a copy of the paper, feel free to email me. My email is on the top of the handout. Um, and also, that paper is being folded into the book that I'm working on currently with Maggie Gallagher, which is expected out sometime in 2012. And we are in the final stages of, of, of completing that manuscript. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for being here today because I realize that this is a very busy time of the semester and also that I'm competing against the Occupy movement uh, teach, teach in or whatever is going on uh, regarding that. So, so thank you for, for, for taking time out to be here today. And I want to make this very informal and I don't want to speak for a, a very long time because I'd love to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. My interest today is in the definitional objection to same-sex marriage. Um, and it's an objection that I've heard increasingly as I've worked on this issue, and has recently been made popular by none other than presidential candidate Rick Santorum, who at many of his campaign appearances has taken to pulling up out a napkin or whatever he can find. He uses different examples, but it usually involves a napkin, uh, and he says, you know, this is a napkin. It is what it is. It's not a paper towel. We could call it a paper towel, but it's still a napkin. Um, and in a similar way, he suggests that even though there are certain states and other jurisdictions that refer to certain same-sex relationships as marriages, um, they are what they are, and whatever they are is not a marriage. Now, Rick Santorum can always be relied on to, to say funny things, but uh, but but other people have put forth this objection as well. Maggie Gallagher, with whom I'm co-authoring this book for Oxford, has written, politicians can pass a bill saying a chicken is a duck, and that doesn't make it true. Truth matters. Uh, Alliance Defense Fund, Fund attorney uh, Jeffrey Ventrella, in a law review article, writes, to advocate same-sex marriage, the scare quotes there are important, is logically equivalent to seeking to draw a square circle. One may passionately and sincerely persist in pining about square circles, but the fact of the matter is one will never be able to actually draw one. The public square has no room for square circles because, like the tooth fairy, they don't really exist. And finally, Robert H. Knight, who is a political commentator and writer, writes, the point is that destroying definitions does enormous damage not only to marriage but to the idea of truth. Calling the union of two lesbians, or presumably two men, a marriage is telling a lie. So, these people see the push for same-sex marriage as fundamentally confused. Certainly, we can pass laws recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages. In fact, we could pass laws recognizing anything as a marriage. But their point is that in doing so, we'd be engaged in a kind of category mistake. There would be a sort of confusion going on, much like the old um, saying about Abraham Lincoln, where he says, how many legs would a dog have if we called its tail a leg? And he answers, four. Calling the tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Calling these unions marriages does not make it a marriage. And what I'm interested in is whether there's anything to this argument or if it's just a lot of rhetorical bluster. Um, 
And you can probably guess where I'm going to go with this. I'm going to argue that it's a lot of rhetorical bluster. <laughs> but before I get there, um, I think that there are interesting things to be said about at least the attempt to make this into a kind of independent argument. So I want to be very clear on this. The idea behind this argument is not that same-sex marriage is a bad idea, that it would have bad consequences, that it would harm children, that it would harm society, and so on. These people believe all of those things, and they make arguments about those things. But what they're trying to say here is an additional argument, namely that they can't even possibly be marriages, and to call them marriages is to make a kind of conceptual mistake. And as I was working on this, part of me thought, well, maybe I'm just reading this wrong. I mean, maybe what they're doing when they say these things is trying to sort of carve out their space in the debate and, and, and take a stand, and like, this is where we stand on marriage, but they're not really trying to make an argument out of it. It's just a, a rhetorical point. But then in the book that we're working on, and I'll give you a little sneak preview, um, Ma Maggie Gallagher writes, because my argument is often understood as merely consequentialist, let me make it clear that the first reason to oppose treating same-sex unions as marriages it's not in your handout. It's on, it's on the, I, I can't give you this. This is all embargoed. Okay? We're going to pretend that this is not on the tape right now. Okay. This is mad. Okay, she writes, because the, my argument is often misunderstood as merely consequentialist, let me make it clear that the first reason to oppose treating same-sex unions as marriages is that it is not true. Same-sex unions are not marriages. So not only does she think that this is an independent argument, she thinks, and she says elsewhere, that this is the deepest and most important argument, that these things are just not really married. <clears throat> All right, so in trying to make sense of the argument, I looked at further elabor elaborations of it, and um, it's actually hard to find elaborations of it. And one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to force Gallagher to elaborate on it, because I think in forcing her to do that, I'm going to make it clear that this is a lot of rhetorical bluster. Um, but Robert Knight, at least, in print has tried to elaborate, and here's what he says. This is on your handout. When the meaning of a word becomes more inclusive, the exclusivity that it previously defined is lost. For instance, if the state of Hawaii decided to extend the famous and exclusive Maui onion appellation to all onions grown in Hawaii, the term Maui onion would lose its original meaning as a specific thing. Consumers would lack confidence in buying a bag of Maui onions if all onions could be labeled as such. Uh, David Blankenhorn, who's president of the Institute for American Values, has a similar kind of elaboration. He says, look, imagine if we use the term ballet to refer to all forms of dance. Something would be lost there, some mistake would be made there. He thinks we're doing something similar when we call all committed unions marriages, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual. Now, I think these elaborations are interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, if you take Knight's elaboration having to do with Maui onion, um, the term Maui onion does refer to a specific variety of onion grown on the island of Maui. But we could imagine taking, growing an, a genetically identical form of onion on, say, the Big Island, or on Kauai, or on Oahu, or on some other Hawaiian island. And we could imagine that there might be very good reasons for onion growers to refer to these as Maui onions, because the variety originated in Maui is genetically identical, and especially if it turned out that they were the same in taste, texture, color, shelf life, and so on. It might not only be permissible, but even desirable to call these onions grown on the Big Island Maui onions. Why? Well, because language is a way of communicating things, and sometimes, you know, for reasons of convenience, um, we group things together under a single label, and there are good reasons to do this. So, the strange thing about Knight's elaboration, I think, is that he actually um, gives us, you know, reason to suspect that. Uh, it's, 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 it's possible and, and permissible and sometimes even desirable to make terms more inclusive in this way. Um, and we, we've done, we do this with other things. Uh, an example, I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, but sometimes people use the term champagne to refer to all sparkling wine, uh, including Prosecco or Cava or, or California sparkling wine and so on. Why? Because for certain purposes, that, that's just fine. We, we don't need to make finer grain distinctions. So, there's a question about whether there's a good reason, whether it's important to make a finer grain distinction when talking about 
committed relationships. The other interesting thing to note about both Knight's elaboration and Blankenhorn's elaboration is that they both, to me at least, point to a kind of consequentialist argument. Why would it be bad, on Knight's view, to refer to all onions as Maui onions? Or why would it be bad, on Blankenhorn's view, to refer to all things <coughs> as ballet? Well, because it would frustrate human aims. Uh, if I go to the theater and I expect ballet and I end up getting river dance, I'm probably going to be disappointed. If I go to the grocer and I want Maui onions and I get plain small white onions, I'm probably going to be disappointed. But it doesn't seem there's anything directly similar when we're talking about the marriage debate. I mean, nobody worries that you know I'm going to walk down the aisle, lift the bride's veil, and say, oh my god, you're a dude. What happened? Right? So there's not this sort of same problem of um, mislabeling, uh, un you know, frustrated expectations on the, the part of consumers or other people. Maybe the similarity is indirect. Maybe by using the term marriage in a more inclusive way, we would distort something. We would um, lead people down paths that they don't want to be led down for one reason or another. But the interesting thing about that is then we're in the realm of consequentialist arguments. Then what we're saying is that if we approach um, relationships in this way, and we call both same-sex and different-sex relationships marriages. We use the same term for both. That that's going to have bad effects on society. That it's going to make it harder to bind parents with their children, for example, to use one of Gallagher's consequentialist arguments. That it's going to um, confuse people about the distinctive value of sexual relations. These are all consequences that might ensue if we stretch the term marriage to include both kinds of relationships. But Gallagher and various other people who use this argument quite explicitly say that no, this is not a consequentialist argument. This is somehow an independent argument that says even apart from later consequences, even apart from further effects, it would be bad because it would be wrong to label these unions marriages. It's not just that they're undesirable, it's that it's impossible somehow. So the elaboration suggests that either they don't understand their own argument or um, that there are actually two different arguments going on here, a sort of consequentialist argument about using a term in a certain way and a pure definitional argument that says, look, in order, if we, if we call these unions marriages, we're making a mistake even apart from problems that might occur later on. All right, so here are some questions to raise now. Um, one is a question about whether what we have here is a merely verbal dispute. Maybe we're just referring to, we're using the term marriage in different ways, and once we um, straighten that out, uh, we will get past the dispute that we have. Um, so so here's, here's another way to look at this. Uh, go back to Ventrella's example about square circles and modify it slightly. Surely there is no such thing as a square ball or a cubicle ball, to use a more precise but, but longer term. Okay, there's no such thing as a, as a cubicle ball or a square ball. However, um, I am told by friends of mine who played tennis that uh, sometimes um, coaches would have them practice with irregularly shaped rubber balls, irregularly shaped rubber objects, which bounce in an erratic way in order to improve their reflexes. Let us suppose, for the sake of example, that some of these are cubicle in shape. So you have these cubicle rubber objects that tennis players are using during practice in order to improve their reflexes. And let us suppose that the coaches call them square balls. Okay, so today we're going to use the square balls for practice. Now, we could engage in an interesting academic debate about whether there could possibly ever be such a thing as a square ball. But that would seem to have absolutely no relevance to whether we ought to use them during practice. And it doesn't seem to me to have very much relevance to whether it's okay to refer to these things as square balls. Square ball seems to be a convenient term for these objects, and people seem to do just fine using them. So one wonders if this is one of those kinds of things where we're really just debating about what to call things, not engaged in a more substantive debate. Now, the people on the other side of the debate are going to say, no, absolutely not. This is not a purely verbal dispute. Um, and I suspect that they're right, 
that this is not a purely verbal dispute. So let me give you an example of a, of a purely verbal dispute. Um, go back to the champagne example. Suppose we're arguing about whether to serve champagne at the reception. Um, uh, I say no, you say yes, and we keep arguing and finally say, fine, you take care of the beverages at the reception. You show up at the reception and you see me passing around glasses of, of a sparkling bubbly beverage and you say, John, I thought you said we weren't going to serve champagne. And I say, we're not serving champagne, we're serving Prosecco. <sighs> fine, okay, we did. When you said champagne, you just meant dry sparkling wine. When I said champagne, I meant something very specific dry sparkling wine grown from grapes, uh, made from grapes grown in the Champagne region of France. We just meant something different by champagne, and our disagreement there was purely verbal. My debate with people on the other side of this issue is not like that. They are more like the people who at that point would say, no, 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 Prosecco is no substitute for champagne. You should not call them the same thing. When you do so, you're making a big mistake. You are telling a lie. You are perpetuating a falsehood. You are destroying the very meaning of truth, whatever elaborate language you want to use there. So this is not, as they see it, a, a purely verbal dispute. It's a dispute about the core nature of marriage and keeping that special, noticing it as special, treating it as special, and so on. Interestingly, um, when we look to debates over civil unions and whether that's an acceptable substitute for marriage, uh, that I think sheds light or, or, or lends support to the claim that this is not a purely verbal dispute because there are a lot of people who are against same-sex marriage but have no problem with granting civil unions or some other status under some other name to same-sex couples. Why? Because they think that these things are different enough that they ought to be named differently and treated somewhat differently at least, that the different name signifies a different reality. And of course there are a lot of people on my side of the debate who want to say civil unions, even if they have all of the legal incidents uh, or virtually all of the legal incidents of marriage, are not enough. Why? Because the different name signifies a difference and ultimately signifies a kind of hierarchy. So that naming is important here. It's not just about what we call things, but ultimately about how we treat them. But that leads to another question about whether this debate, I said it's ultimately about how we treat them, whether this debate is ultimately a moral debate and how we get a moral debate out of the definitional objection. Because when you look at the definitional objection, what the proponents are saying is that that's just not marriage, and if we call it marriage, we're making a mistake. Um, but making a kind of conceptual or epistemic mistake is not the same thing as making a moral mistake. Uh, and just because we mislabel something or misidentify something, it doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. In fact, um, there may be times where we are not only permitted, but even required to, to do something like that. So suppose I can, con suppose somebody is, is trapped under a fallen tree and I can falsely convince myself that I am Superman and that I have superhuman powers and that I can leap tall buildings in a single bound and I can do those things. And suppose that by falsely convincing myself of this, I can muster the adrenaline to, to lift the tree and save the person. It is at least permissible and indeed probably even required for me, if I can muster the false belief in this case, to, to do so. So the, the interesting question here is how this conceptual debate, this debate about what marriage really is and how we categorize it, becomes a moral debate about how we ought to treat certain relationships vis-a-vis -vis other relationships. And as we'll see in a moment, the one group that I see that actually makes any effort to integrate those two questions, the conceptual question and the moral question, are the new natural lawyers. That they think that those questions are tied together intimately and they try to explain how they're tied together. And I will try to explain to you how they, how they do this. One final question, though, before we move on to the new natural lawyers, though. Um, here's an interesting thing about the, the definitional objection. Um, the definitional objection seems to suggest that there is this thing out there in nature, marriage, that we can either recognize correctly or fail to recognize correctly. 
um, but that its boundaries exist independently of human recognition. This strikes me and many people as kind of weird because marriage is a social institution and social institutions generally have malleable boundaries that, they, that are created by human beings and can be recreated by human beings and that it's not a matter of getting them right or getting them wrong in the sense of they're out there and we can either see them or fail to see them. It's that we can create them in better, more helpful, more productive ways or in less good, less, less productive ways. Now, in saying that, I don't mean to suggest that social institutions are infinitely malleable and that or that they're easily malleable. Um, I do think that um, social institutions, once created, have a kind of independent reality and that there are times where we can make changes that end up just changing the institution and there are times where we can make changes that replace the institution with something else. So take something that we would all agree is socially constructed, a game like baseball. If I add the designated hitter rule or take away the designated hitter rule, we're still talking about baseball just with a, a slight difference in the rules. Um, but if I reduce the number of players to two and um, put rackets in their hands and you know stretch a net across the court or something, I'm talking about something else. And it might be a game worth playing, um, it might be even more worth playing than the game we were playing before, but it's a different game. Um, I don't think we need to sort of get into figuring out whether in this particular case we're talking about a change in the institution or a replacement institution. The real morally salient question as I see it is whether this is a good idea, whether this is a change or, if you will, a replacement that we ought to make or not. And the way I often sum that up is in something that I call the marriage-marriage maneuver. Suppose I were to say to Gallagher, you know what, Maggie, you're right. What we're talking about, what I've been advocating for, isn't marriage at all. It's something else. Let's call it schmarriage. But I think schmarriage is actually better than marriage. It's more inclusive. It serves both same-sex couples and different-sex couples. It can still do the work of marriage while also bringing other people into the fold and so on. So. You're right that what I'm advocating is not marriage, it, it's something else, it's marriage, but marriage is a good idea, isn't it? So let's just do that. And you know what? Um, marriage is a hard word to say, it's not going to really catch on, so we're going to call it marriage, we'll just use, but it's a homonym, it's not, we're talking about the same thing, it's, we're going to just use uh, the same word, or the homonym, hom, 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 <laughs> forget it, the word that is a homonym, uh, for this new thing. Uh, marriage, and we'll just call it marriage. Are you okay with that? And of course she's not going to be okay with that because ultimately what she's really arguing for is that we should not treat committed same-sex couples in the same way that we treat committed different sex couples. So, to sum up the definitional objection, and the summary is on the top of the second page, using the term marriage to refer to same-sex unions would in effect replace marriage with a different institution, one that lacks marriage as essential character. This replacement would originate in speech, but would ultimately affect practice, as people failed to notice what is distinctively valuable about, quote unquote, real marriage. And this des desensitization would be bad in itself, apart from any further consequences. So this is what they're trying to argue. Okay, so where's the argument for that? Uh, the group that I think does the best job of arguing and the best job of trying to explain how marriage could be this independent reality out there in nature apart from human cultural practices and boundaries are a group all known as the new natural lawyers or the new natural law theorists. I, they're actually typically in the literature referred to as new natural lawyers, but a lot of people get confused by that because they're not all lawyers. Um, and, and I, I, I actually, any of them. What's that? Hardly any of them, I would think. And hardly, well, yes, <laughs> in some sense, right? Uh, I mean, many, many of them have gone to law school uh, uh, or have been in law schools and opened up books inside of law schools or something. Um, but uh, so, so these new natural law theorists, uh, they're, they find their roots in the old natural law of people like St. Thomas Aquinas, but they have a very different argument against homosexual conduct. Um, Aquinas's argument against homosexual conduct had to do with the um, natural purpose of organs and the idea that anyone who used the sexual organs for some purpose not geared toward procreation was doing something unnatural, uh, irrational, and therefore wrong. 
uh, these people do not appeal to natural functions of organs because they recognize, among other problems, that uh, Aquinas' view would imply that it would be wrong to walk on your hands because that's not what the hands are, quote unquote, designed for. Uh, oddly enough, Aquinas himself uses that, recognizes that counterexample, but when he comes to talking about sexuality, he forgets about it or, or pretends it's not relevant or something. So, um, so they recognize this as a real problem, there would be a real inconsistency here. So they do something else. What they do is argue that there is something about the two-in-one flesh union of a man and a woman that is fundamentally good. They refer to it as a basic good. And by basic good, they mean you can't derive it from some more general good like happiness or pleasure or health or something. Um, that they're, they're pluralists about goods. And among the goods is this thing that they call marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is a comprehensive union between two people. Comprehensive in the sense that it's a union on the intellectual or volitional level as well as on the physical level. Uh, in order for it to be a union on the intellectual and volitional level, the person has to be completely committed to the other person. Uh, that person needs to be their um, ex exclusive focus in some sense and vice versa. In order for it to be a union on the physical level, the people have to unite biologically. How do they do this? Well, they do this in acts of the procreated kind, namely coitus. Only in coitus can the two literally become one. So the idea here is that there's something fundamentally good about this comprehensive union of marriage. And the problem with homosexuality becomes that it's a kind of counterfeit version of this that it distracts us away from the real good that is marriage and replaces it with a counterfeit good. And furthermore, it involves a kind of disintegrity because it treats the body as a mere instrument of pleasure rather than as a, an integrated part of the total self. So ultimately, their argument against homosexual conduct um, is that homosexual conduct is akin to a kind of masturbation, and they think masturbation is wrong. As I've often um, said in, in public discussions of this, if, you, if you're going to make your argument against same-sex marriage contingent on the view that masturbation is morally wrong, you have a very high burden of persuasion. Um, but somehow that doesn't seem to worry them. OK, fine. Um, focusing specifically on the marriage issue, though, the way they approach the definitional objection is as follows. They say, look, there are two different ways that we could understand marriage here. One of them is our view, the new natural law view, and we're going to refer to that as the conjugal view of marriage. And on the conjugal view, marriage, in the pre-legal sense, this reality that exists apart from what the state and society and the government does, is a comprehensive union between a man and a woman consummated by reproductive type acts, namely coitus, which unite them biologically and thus personally. It's the only way you can have this full union by also uniting biologically. Whereas the alternative view put forth by people like me, John Corvino, is what they call a revisionist view. Marriage is an emotional union of two people of any sex who commit to mutual care and who may engage in whatever sexual acts they find mutually agreeable. Um, if that's coitus, great. But if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a heterosexual couple and you don't want to engage in coitus, that's fine, too. I actually believe that. So. Uh, and what they want to say is that the conjugal view better captures our intuitions about what marriage is than the revisionist view. And the way they integrate the conceptual argument and the moral argument is by saying that, look, if we fail to recognize and see this good thing called marriage, we're failing to appreciate a basic good. We're being distracted from a genuine good, and it's bad to distract people from what's good. So the, the conceptual argument and the moral argument are tied closely together for them. All right, so let me talk about some objections to the view. Let me talk about the standard objection to the view, and then let me talk about my objection to, to, to the view, um, which, for whatever reasons, um, People have not yet picked up on the literature, but I'm hoping to change that. Uh, standard objection to the view has to do with 
um, permanently infertile heterosexual couples. Um, look, suppose you have a man and a woman who cannot possibly procreate. Let's say the woman's uterus has been removed for medical reasons. Or let's say the woman is past childbearing age. Let's say she's 80 years old. Um, do you want to say that such people cannot engage in sex or that they cannot marry? And of course, these people do not want to say that uh, because they are sane. So, uh, to an extent. And so, um, so what they say is that such people, even though they cannot engage in acts that result in procreation, they can still engage in acts of the procreative type. Um, so now I'm going to read at some length from uh, a paper by Sharif Gerges, Robert George, and Ryan Anderson that appeared in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Um, uh, and how, his, here's how they try to respond to the infertile couples objection, which I often refer to as the sterile couples objection because infertile couples makes it sound like maybe they're trying to procreate, but they yeah. can't. You know. So I, you know, I want to make it clear that we're talking about couples known to be permanently infertile. Uh, uh, not that, you know, they're, they're aiming at it, but they, they, they can Okay. So here's what they write. They say, individual adults are naturally incomplete with respect to one biological function, sexual reproduction. In coitus, but not in other forms of sexual contact, a man and a woman's bodies coordinate by way of their sexual organs for the common biological purpose of reproduction. They perform the first step of the complex reproductive process. Thus, their bodies become, in a strong sense, one. They are biologically united and do not merely rub together. In coitus and only in coitus, similarly to the way in which one's heart, lungs, and other organs form a unity by coordinating for the biological good of the whole. They actually say that when, when people engage in coitus, they literally become one organism. This is not metaphorical language for them. In this case, the whole is made up of the man and the woman as a couple, and the biological good of that whole is their reproduction. Here's another way of looking at it. Union on any plane bodily, mental, or whatever, involves mutual coordination on that plane toward a good on that plane. When Einstein and Bohr discussed a physics problem, they coordinated intellectually for an intellectual good, truth. And the intellectual union they enjoyed was real, whether or not its ultimate target, in this case a theoretical solution, was reached. Assuming, as we safely can, that both Einstein and Bohr were honestly seeking truth and not merely pretending while engaging in deception or other acts which would make their apparent intellectual union only an illusion. By extension, bodily union involves mutual coordination toward a bodily good, which is realized only through coitus. And this union occurs even when, pro even when conception, the bodily good toward which sexual intercourse as a biological function is oriented, does not occur. All right, so this is their attempt to respond to the infertile couple's objection, which to me immediately raises the response Yes, but there's a difference between something which does not occur, even though people are honestly seeking it, and something which cannot occur, and thus cannot be honestly sought by anyone who knows that it cannot occur. So it's one thing when Einstein and Bohr are aiming at a solution and believe that that solution is possible, and they try and they don't get it. It's quite another thing if they know a math problem is insoluble, but they still keep tinkering with it for whatever reason they might do that, I don't, I don't know. Um, so the example, I just don't, the analogy, I just don't find very compelling. There is a great deal of back and forth in the literature on this question. And having reviewed uh, quite a lot of it, perhaps most of it, um, he, here's what I've come up with. Um, they, they are quite willing to bite the bullet on this and say, that couples who know themselves to be permanently infertile, heterosexual couples who know themselves to be permanently infertile, can still engage in reproductive type acts. Uh, reproductive type, as they understand the term, is neither necessary nor sufficient for actual reproduction. It's not, it's, it's, um, not sufficient for actual reproduction, because we could be talking about permanently infertile couples. It's not necessary for, for actual reproduction, because you can imagine somebody um, ejaculating into a test tube and then um, combining that sperm with an ovum and a petri dish and planting it, reproduction occurs. As far as they're concerned, no reproductive type act has occurred during that, even though it actually ends up in reproduction. So what do they mean by reproductive type? Um, and the answer, as far as I can tell, is coitus. 
When they say reproductive type, they're really just saying coital, penis and vagina sex. Um, why is that special uh, as far as they're concerned? Well, it's special because of the coordination. It is coordination toward an end, but their focus is not on the end, it's on the coordination. And they think that there's something good about that coordination, even apart from the possibility of the end. This is interesting in the context of a discussion of marriage because it ties into their notion of marriage as a comprehensive union. Um, if you think of marriage as a comprehensive union in the way that they do, how is it that human beings can truly physically unite? Well, there are a lot of ways you could, could argue that, but one at least intuitive way that, that someone might go with and that they go with is this idea, well, um, we are creatures who reproduce sexually and that requ sexual reproduction requires a male and a female and that there's something special and distinctive about the male-female union in sexual reproduction that just doesn't get reproduced anywhere else. Um, okay, uh, so if you think of marriage as a comprehensive union, which includes union on the bodily level, and you think that the only way we can truly unite biologically is through coitus, then it does follow from those premises that the heterosexual sterile couple can engage in reproductive type acts and the same-sex couple cannot. But it also follows from that premise that the following people are ineligible for marriage. Imagine a, people, imagine a couple, a heterosexual couple, who are engaged to marry, um, and during their engagement the, there's a terrible accident and the man becomes paralyzed from the waist down such that he cannot perform coitus. Um, and imagine that the two of them marry legally anyway, uh, maybe they go on to adopt children, or maybe um, through some artificial reproductive techniques they are able to have children, and they live their lives together for 50, 60, 70 years, or whatever it is, uh, and so on. On the new natural law of you, those couple, in fact, that couple, in fact, never married. They were never eligible for marriage. Um, and by recognizing their marriage, the state is, in fact, engaged in a kind of, I'll use their language, the language they use for same-sex couples, lie. Okay, we're lying about what marriage really is because marriage is a comprehensive union which must include the biological union of coitus. Well, if you say that, then any couple incapable of coitus or any couple who chooses not to engage in coitus for whatever reason cannot marry, uh, including the heterosexual couple. Now, there are other counterexamples to the view having to do with contraception and divorced couples and so on, but I think that one is just devastating enough. All right, I think it's just so obvious that Marriage, um, you know, even if you want to, to say that um, coitus is relevant to the meaning of marriage in some, in some sense, because of a typical feature or so on, you don't want to make it a necessary condition such that any couple incapable of coitus is not eligible for marriage, but that's what their view entails. So, they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, but when I pointed this out to them, interestingly, uh, they, they've never told me, oh, no, John, you, 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 you're misunderstanding things. Uh, they've never publicly bit the bullet on it either, but I intend to force them to do so with my book. Um, but what they have tried to do in emails with me is to say, well, you know, yes, we have, there are embarrassing features of our view, but, you know, you can't just argue that our view is counterintuitive by pointing out one way in which it's counterintuitive. You have to compare it to the counterintuitive, impl counterintuitive implications of your view. And I said, okay, what are the counterintuitive implications of my view? Um, and the ones that they standardly point out and that they point out in their paper, and I'll just go through these quickly. This is on letter C on page three. Um, they say that their view fits better with our intuitions about what marriage is because historically non-consummation uh, was considered grounds for annulment, whereas infertility was not considered grounds for annulment. Uh, and, I, and I grant that that was true historically, although today that um, is no longer true uh, in most, most jurisdictions do not uh, have the same um, laws about uh, uh, consummation with respect to annulment. Uh, but I also think that you could explain those views not just by appealing to their understanding of what marriage is, but also by appealing to outdated notions of female purity, 
um, concerns about whether the wife might be pregnant if they consummated the relationships and so on. So I don't, I don't think their, their view is the only way to explain um, the history of laws about consummation. They say that only on their view can marriage, can you explain how marriage has a special link to child rearing? I think that this is very strange because actually since procreative type acts are neither necessary nor sufficient for the production of children, as far as I'm concerned, they've divorced their view from connection to child rearing. The, 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 the connection between marriage and child rearing, if there is any left at that point, is that they want to say marriage is the most, is the best um, environment for child rearing. That's something that I can say just as easily on the so-called revisionist view. Um, they say that on their view, but not on the revisionist view, we can explain why marriage consists of two and only two people. Uh, and they write, marriage can be achieved by two and only two because no single act can organically unite three or more people at the bodily level. As one of my colleagues pointed out, not unless they're very limber. <laughs> or therefore seal a comprehensive union of three or more lives at other levels. Indeed, the very comprehensiveness of the union requires the marital commitment to be undivided, made exactly to one other person, but such comprehensiveness and the exclusivity its orientation to children demands make sense only on the conjugal view. Um, no, um, that's just wrong. Uh, look, what's distinctive about the conjugal view, uh, as, as opposed to the revisionist view, has to do with their notion of biological unity. Uh, the fact that if you want to sexually make a child, that requires one man and one woman to sexually make a child. How anyone could get an argument uh, about exclusivity out of the biological facts of reproduction um, is, is beyond me, right? So yes, it requires one man and one woman to make a child, but it doesn't follow from that that they can't then biologically, physically make children with other people in, in various iterations of that. So if you want to get um, exclusivity out of that, what do you need? You need um, some kind of exclusive emotional commitment. You need this notion that this person is your number one person and vice versa, and that somehow excludes the possibility of other people. But if you're doing that on the emotional level, there's nothing at, in the revisionist view that prevents you from doing that equally well on the revisionist view. So they have absolutely no unique argument against uh, polygamy that would not be available to revisionists. And then finally, they say only on their view can we understand why the state is properly interested in marriage, and again, they tie this to child rearing because of marriage's orientation to procreation. Um, the state is properly interested in it. But again, they've divorced um, marriage from actual reproduction by treating reproductive acts um, as neither necessary nor sufficient for reproduction. So if, if it boils down to the state's interest in child rearing, um, there's nothing about their view that it makes that uh, distinctively important. So, um, to conclude, I don't think that the new natural lawyers have given us reason to think that there is this reality out there, marriage, that we can, that, that has the, con the boundaries or has the contours that they think it does, and that if we fail to recognize that <coughs> legally and recognize only that legally, we've done something immoral. Let me conclude by saying something about why I think this objection is um, unsatisfying um, and, and, and uh, problematic for uh, a variety of reasons, but, but one reason in particular. The definitional objection essentially says that we've got this understanding of marriage, you've got a very different understanding of marriage, um, and your view of understanding of marriage is wrong. I, of course, could say exactly the same thing, right? Okay, so yeah, we obviously must have some kind of different understanding of what marriage is, because you think marriage is necessarily heterosexual. I don't. So I could say that your definition is wrong, but what I couldn't do or shouldn't do is to try to treat that as an independent argument for my position. That's not an argument for my position. That's just a reassertion of, well, I think this about marriage. You think that about marriage. Okay, we know where, where I stand. We know where you stand. Now what we need to do is to come up with some argument for why one approach to marriage is a better way to go than some other approach to marriage. Um, if I may go back to the baseball analogy that I used earlier. Uh, 
when the designated hitter rule was introduced to baseball, which allowed um, somebody else to bat in place of the pitcher, there were certainly purists who said, that's not baseball. Okay. Um, now, there may be good reasons to eliminate the designated hitter rule. Um, there may be good reasons uh, why we shouldn't have made the change in the first place. One can make all those kinds of arguments. But imagine somebody today were to argue against the designated hitter rule on the grounds that that's not true, and those who call that baseball are telling a lie. I mean, it would just be a failure to engage the debate. If we want to come up with reasons for or against this rule, give me those reasons. But if you just keep insisting that that's the wrong view of baseball, you're not giving an argument. You're just asserting your position. Um, and I think what's happening is that the reason that people are leaning more and more on the definitional objection, people like Rick Santorum, people like Maggie Gallagher, is they've run out of plausible sounding real arguments. And so that the best they can do is to go in these circles about definitions and truth and so on without really engaging the debate. And I think that's kind of unfortunate and sad. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm going to try to call them out on it. Thank you. Um, terrific, as always. Um, I have a, a number of reactions. Some things I, I've already communicated to you by email, so I won't repeat them. But I, I, I think in, I sometimes I'm concerned that the, the argument, because the argument is, is directed against people who are um, themselves handicapped by uh, being tied down to the defense of, of a conclusion that they have to defend regardless of whether their argument makes any sense, uh, that it in some ways makes it, makes it easy to, to make overstatements in the arguments against them. Because I think ultimately their position is that this is divinely positive law. Right. Uh, they can't make that argument uh, in, and have it hold up in the kind of, of legal and political discourse that we have in this country, and so they're they're trying to make an argument uh, that that doesn't rely specifically on that. If you just say it's divinely positive, uh, then their argument makes perfect sense. It's just that, that, that there's a practical problem with it. Yeah. Um, the other, but you know, along the way, um, the, the the analogies uh, you know, talk about the I mean, people. You know, on the other side, just sort of give bad analogies. I think uh, the, this, uh, the business about the champagne, the business about uh, uh, what was the other the one, the, uh, the ballet. Um, the, the, there are important um, words that have been contested historically that where, where the, the issues become much more uh, uh, serious. And to take two very different kinds, uh, yogurt and torture. Um, yogurt, uh, Very yogurt, 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 <laughs> well, yogurt goes to a, an actual case the European Court of Justice years ago, which I don't remember a lot of the details about, but the, the, the critical question in, you know, in terms of the common market was this, this, this matter of whether it has to have live yogurt cultures in order to be yogurt. Um, and of course, from one perspective, this was a kind of protectionism that French yogurt producers were trying to use to obstruct the common market. And, and from another perspective, um, it's, it's not really yogurt if it doesn't have yogurt cultures. And, and that is a, a kind of, and it goes to this question about people being misled and providing a certain imprimatur on something that is, um, you know, d distorts then the sorts of, of uh, incentive structure we're trying to put in place for public policy purposes. So, uh, so, so it can, I mean, there are, there are serious reasons why we insist on terms uh, that the French lost that case, but it, it wasn't clear to me that they should have. Um, the, the other, the torture one, is more serious, and that if you t if you take the language at the top of your second page here, and you you make all the changes ceteris paribus, you know, uh, to uh, to to make it uh, um, uh, the the you know a discussion about torture, it would become immediately apparent why it would be offensive um, to uh, you know manipulate what counts as torture. Uh, in a way that deviates from what someone might, from a secular national law perspective, characterize as torture, and this obviously is not a hypothetical point. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's important to to um, not fall into the trap, I would say, of of making making the the structure of the argument sound like that's what the problem is, 
whereas the, the real problem goes to deeper in the content that, that, that you know, they, can't, they can't make the sort of argument about marriage that can be made about torture for a very specific kind of reason. Um, well, but here's a, I mean, I think those are both very helpful points. Um, and I wasn't aware of the yogurt example, although that's a nice example. Uh, but here's the important difference on the torture issue. Um, I assume that we start from uh, a shared belief that torture is a bad thing that ought to be avoided. Um, and so then the question of whether something is torture or not automatically has moral implications. Um, you, you wouldn't have a sort of torture schmorcher argument. It's like, well, it, it's torture, but let's go for it. You know, it, but that, I mean, you wouldn't. We've come very close to that. We, well, yeah. <laughs> Some people have yes. come very close to that, sadly. But right. So, um, in the case of marriage, where what we're contesting is whether marriage can include same-sex couples, and you know, simply arguing that this is not marriage. Uh, without sort of engaging why marriage, without sort of explaining why marriage needs to be exclusive heter heter exclusively heterosexual, is, in my view, to fail to engage the actual debate. And, and for a while, I thought, okay, maybe I'm just not being fair. Maybe I'm, I'm treating this as if it were an independent argument against same-sex marriage, um, but they don't really mean it as such. And then Gallagher, in the book, actually comes out and says the deepest and most important reason to oppose this is that it's false. Okay, well, now, now that's a circular argument, and she wants to say that it's not, right? It's a circular argument in the context of this debate because the whole thing we're debating about is whether marriage can include same-sex couples, and, and, and simply asserting that it can't is to assert a conclusion. It's not to engage the argument. Uh, whereas in the torture case, I think, um, we're, we're already in agreement that uh, torture is something to avoid, so now we're asking, whether this particular action meets the threshold of torture or not. Uh, and then I have to give you arguments for whether, why it does or why it doesn't. What, what are the relevant features? So if Gallagher wanted to do something uh, similar, she'd have to sort of give arguments for why this fails to meet the threshold of marriage. And, and she, see, she at times tries to do that, um, but she spends less time trying to do that than she does sort of spinning these circles about that's not marriage. But you're, you're assigning the same significance to the word marriage as she is, right. in turn, because it, it's connected to this imprimatur. It does, yes. And so the only question is whether it's worthy of the imprimatur, and that's, right. that, that's, a, right. that's the substantive argument. Right, and, and, and if, we want to, if we want to engage in the debate over whether same-sex relationships are worthy of the imprimatur of marriage, then that's a reasonable, non-circular debate to, you know, ar argument for her to be making. But that's, as far as I can tell, not what they're doing. I'm just wondering when, when we started letting Maggie and everybody take control of the definition of marriage and narrow it. I mean, we have words like hound that used to mean all dogs, but now it makes a certain kind of dog. Yeah, I mean, our, there are a lot of examples of this. Uh, you know, art used to refer only to representational art, um, and that, you know, people who looked at what we would now call abstract art would say, well, that's not art. Whatever it is, it's not art. Um, and, and now, I mean, language is malleable this way, and, and marriage is malleable. I mean, this, you know, and this you know, goes back to this question about whether there's something very strange in what they're doing in treating marriage as this fixed, I mean, what philosophers would sometimes refer to as a natural kind, that is something that has boundaries in nature independent of our recognition of it, which we, we might do for like elements or blood types or you know, other, usually you know, biological or, or chemical things. Um, but they're treating marriage this way. Uh, and that makes absolutely no sense to me, except you know, going back to something that Brad said, um, there are actually other people who think of marriage as having boundaries in nature and, and independently of human recognition, which are the people who think that marriage is divinely ordained, right? So if God sets up what marriage is and says this is marriage, um, then marriage has boundaries independent of what human beings think that it has. But, but of course, that's not the argument that they're making publicly for the most part. I just think a, 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 a while ago I, I would hear the word marriage used more metaphorically. You don't see it so much anymore marriage between companies or marriage between 
egg whites and sugar to make we, we, we would grain. We would marry the ketchup when I worked as a waiter. It's probably, it's probably not legal to do anymore because it's probably unsanitary. But at the end of the day, we would go around with the ketchup bottles that were like half empty and, you know, Put, take two half empty ones and fill them up <laughs> so that each table would have a full bottle of ketchup at the end of the day. We call that marrying the ketchup. Not anymore. Not anymore, no. <laughs> but, for, but for all kinds of reasons, maybe, one of which maybe, is. Maybe uniting, uniting the ketchup civilly. <laughs> 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 Domestically partnering the ketchup. Partnering the ketchup. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, but you're right, but there is something interesting about the sort of ownership of the word marriage, right? Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to, to the book coming out and there being public discussion of the stuff that, 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 that's written in here, and particularly the stuff that she writes in there, because there is this, I mean, one of the reasons I think it's hard for them to get away from the definitional objection is because it's, it's just so clear to them and so obvious to them that marriage has this meaning and that people like me who want to um, argue that same-sex couples can be married are obviously changing the meaning of marriage as if it's really clear that the, the meaning of marriage is exclusively heterosexual. And I don't think it is. But. I'm put in mind of Stanley Cavell's aesthetic problems of modern philosophy here, um, which is the, the art, one of the arguments there is that at sort of at the, at what he's, you know, actually it's around the question of what is art. So when modernism pushes the limits of what is art, that has a specific aesthetic force. There's a reason for why you would do that that's internal to the logic of the development of aesthetics. And that is to say that the violation of, or the, the, the changing of what marriage is for these people actually has a specific aesthetic and moral content. He says, he has this gloss that says that what we've discovered when we, you know, are disagreeing about whether something works as art is that there are certain kinds of judgments that can't be fully explicitated. And he has this gloss that goes, art, moral, um, we, the, the arguments of aesthetics, morals and politics do not have the same kinds of epistemic criteria by which you could adduce agreement. And, and so that there are ways of having a sort of compelling but non-demonstrable judgment that don't automatically redound to divine positing, right? But that they have the, the type uh, or character of either aesthetic and, and for him, moral judgments. And that so, any- So that by that, calling something art that entails a kind of significance that we can't necessarily spell out in terms of criteria. Right, but that, that is actually endemic to the fact that it's an aesthetic judgment. Like, mm -hmm. if, it, if you could explicitate it, it would no longer be aesthetics, mm -hmm. right? A judgment of beauty has to be made in freedom, you know, there's a Kantian inheritance there, but it has to made in, be made in freedom with um, a kind of positing of general assent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that it also could not be made explicit because then it wouldn't be without a concept, right? So, but, and, and he has this gloss where he says that arguments in politics and morals are fundamentally of the same kind as aesthetic judgments, and that therefore you would have ways of starting from an attachment, the sense that you have that same-sex couples are, cannot get married, that does not have the, the structure of divine positing, but is actually endemic to the kind of judgment that it is, that you would never be able to make a fully compelling argument for it. And that what the natural law people are doing is they're mistaking the nature of the claim that they have, right? Which is that there's something about the moral judgment that same-sex couples aren't um, of the same moral uh, fiber, stature, what have you, as, as uh, heterosexual couples. That, you know, ultimately you don't have to make recourse to natural law or something like that, but actually just the kind of judgment that it is. I'm, um, gonna, I'm going to email you for some for the reference to the Cavell piece there because that sounds very very useful. Um, be, because it, it also and the other thing that that puts me in mind of Cavell is that there's also seems to be a different disagreement or non-agreement about what the nature of definitions are, right? Mm -hmm. Like the you know that there's a, a different idea of the way language works and the ways that we use definitions, right? And right. you you seem to be coming from you know, a sort of post-Wittgensteinian idea that language is social practice and, you know, words accrue meaning, and I, I, of course, agree with you, but that there's, there are other ways of thinking about how language works and what the force of the definition is that I feel like maybe they're not explicitating properly, but, I, you know, I, you know, you're left with the arguments that they make and not right. the arguments that they could make in a right. certain way, but if they were smarter, there would be a way of... Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm well, serious. But there's always an interesting way to go there down be, to try to be, make the arguments better for them, and I, I've tried to do that at times. Uh, because I, I feel like I feel like I could I feel like I could invent an argument that would not be uh, you know uh, susceptible of the same objections that you make, 
um, that they that they're incapable of making because precisely because they have this idea that divine positing is the structure of this argument, as, which is the nat the natural law argument looks like it's you know natural kind that there's the structure of it's ordained in the world, but that there would also be other ways of you know finding uh, you know a, a sort of irreducible claim that wouldn't make the same mistakes. Well, we should talk about this more because that's a really interesting okay. approach. I'm not sure what it would be quite yet, but I have yeah, some well, sketches yeah, for it. Yeah. Time for maybe another question or just two. Or... Yeah. Just wanted to point something for C1 that in the I mean, non consummation is granted by Norman. Yeah. So in the Orthodox uh, Judaism uh, tradition, if uh, a man and a wife um, cannot have children after 10 years, it's supposed to divorce her. Mm. So infertility is. Yeah, in some traditions. That's, 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 I, I, I was so, forgotten that. Though. So one may be, I don't know, you know, the legal situation in the U.S., but it's something that may be coming in Christian tradition and you know, traditional Judaism might have. Uh, Interesting. I think that was true. I was thinking historically because I, I do a lot of work in early modern France, and and you have similar situations where if uh, even if there is consummation but there's infertility, you can request a divorce. And I, and I was also thinking of like how much their model of marriage is based on. Um, this biological union between a man and a woman um, as some kind of natural form of marriage, but you had in, if I'm correct, in the early, in the classical period in antiquity, um, you would only get married. married. Marriage was not based on reproduction, it was based on the exchange of properties. So people who had no money would have, it would be a, right. how do you say it, con they would be concubines. Right. Uh, they would not get married because marriage was based on the on the exchange of, of, of properties. So I think that, I mean, it's just interesting to see how history, you know, there's there, no sense of history or- history is quite revisionist, and I- Right, and, and even, even ethnocentric, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Among other things. Among other, well, one of the things I've had to do in this, especially in responding to um, the initial essay, is to say there are many points here that I'm going to have to leave untouched in, <laughs> right. in the matter of space, but you know, you end up sort of putting in a lot of footnotes, and by the way, you really need to look at this and this and this and this. And, and one of them um, is this, this, this notion, I mean, particularly for natural lawyers coming out of a religious tradition um, that includes the uh, Hebrew scriptures to say that marriage by definition is only between exclusively between one man and one woman. Well, hello, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> hello. Uh, so um, yeah, there's that pro there's that problem too. Right. Okay, I'm just thinking about the um, you said man paralyzed from the waist down and the eighty year old woman beyond childbearing years. Mm -hmm. I'm just surprised the um, Maggie all that made the argument that if you pray hard enough or tithe enough, maybe by some divine miracle, you'll well, Here's why they don't, they, they once tried, somebody once tried to make that argument in front of me, and I said, look, if you're going to start invoking miracles, then lesbian couples can get pregnant, right? Yeah. I mean, and for that matter, so can I, right? Mir <laughs> sure. yeah, miracles are miracles, right? So, so we, you know, once you start invoking divine power, well, there you go. So but that, can, that's, that's can you make a claim that it's a regulative ideal rather than that it's in, that it has normative force rather than you know that you know like there's a center which is heterosexual reproduction and that you know there are a distribution of things that fall short of the ideal that can never be embodied in practice and that falling short of this is endemic to all of human life because it's messy right and that at some point in time you have to make a decision about what is and is not you know. Uh, should receive the moral dignity of marriage, and that in fact, you know, while you know, gender is a more important decision as opposed to paraplegicness, right? Yeah. Or the yeah, ability to get an erection of... is somehow le you're still a man even if you can't get an erection, but you know, like you're, but you know, if you have a penis, you're not a woman, and so therefore, I can't marry then you. Then the right? problem is, is that we get way, I mean, too close for comfort. At least I think they they should be uncomfortable at that point to an obviously circular argument where the reason that you know these two people cannot get married is because they're not a man and a woman. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, but 
the whole, the whole point is we're debating why marriage must be between a man and a woman. But and I, to say because it's not between a man and a woman that we're there is, is, is not answering the question. You know, but ultimately I feel like what's happening is all of the philosophy is making a category mistake of the kind of judgment that's going on, okay, okay, right? Okay, which okay, is, right. but you know, that's a... Well, well, but this, well, I mean, but you know, in a way, the, the philosophers that I'm talking about here, the new natural lawyers, they do, rec they do talk about this as a kind of basic good which cannot be inferred right. from more general premises. Right. Which, that you only can sort of draw out the implications of the view and you either get it or you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that sounds that's, very that's akin the, to what you're talking about. Right, but, but otherwise the, 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 the difference between a civil union or a domestic partnership and a marriage would not have force if that were not the case. At least from on the inside. Like these are people who want to attain to the good or the force or the moral dignity that accrues to marriage because of, you know, this basic good that it carries with it. Right. And they wouldn't be wanting to do so if it didn't have some kind of force outside right. of what you can adduce or what you can argue about logically. Right. Right. And so that with them, what we, what we have to do. Sorry, this is telling me that I have an appointment at one forty-five. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna, I know, I'm gonna uh, but, but, the, but then what we have to do is to try to somehow portray the force of okay, you've got a same-sex couple, two people committing themselves to each other, caring at each other for life, and so on. And, and hope that people get that and the value of that, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we're but, doing. But but you know, but that can't be done by philosophy. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that to be clear. I don't mean that to be clear. No, no, no. Right? I think that the philosophy paves the way for the poets in a way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Thank you all very much.